the ministers, uh, ladies and gentlemen, just a few words in English. Uh, is it okay? Uh, c'est bon maintenant? C'est pas trop fort, non? J'ai l'impression que c'est... Uh, just a few words in English to point out that we have put in place um, French to English and an English to French translation. So for those who want to use it, uh, the devices are available at the front desk. And we will uh, translate uh, all the talks of this morning. So not the workshops. The workshops will be in English. Uh, so we'll switch in French now. Um, donc, Monsieur Buchen, uh, Monsieur le député, Monsieur Adam, uh, Monsieur Fayot, Mesdames et Messieurs, au nom du gouvernement, euh, j'ai le plaisir de vous souhaiter la bienvenue à notre conférence euh, d'aujourd'hui. Donc, euh, mon nom est Huch Patrick et je suis en charge euh, du CERT gouvernemental au Luxembourg. Euh, nous allons aujourd'hui débattre euh, d'un un sujet euh, très intéressant qui est la cybersécurité. C'est un sujet d'actualité qui est souvent à l'ordre du jour de conférences qui sont organisées dans le monde entier. Et ce sujet fait d'ailleurs souvent la une dans la presse écrite aussi. Pour notre débat, nous avons particulièrement choisi d'axer le sujet sur la collaboration. Et en tant que chargé de la direction du cercle gouvernemental, euh, je ne peux que pointer sur l'importance euh, d'une bonne collaboration nationale et internationale. C'est aussi pour cette raison que nous avons choisi euh, de mettre cette conférence sous le thème euh, de la collaboration et de la confiance. Euh, donc, Avant d'inviter euh, Monsieur euh, le ministre euh, François Bilchen à prendre le micro, j'ai encore euh, quelques informations sur le déroulement de la conférence à donner. Donc tout d'abord, euh, nous avons un léger changement de programme qui vient encore de changer. Donc, euh, Monsieur Stéphane de Klerk, euh, ministre de la Justice euh, belge, il a, euh, il a un empêchement, donc il a dû euh, rester en Belgique euh, suite euh, à des travaux majeurs qu'il a à faire euh, au niveau du Parlement. Euh, bien sûr, nous comprenons ses motivations et nous acceptons euh, les excuses de la délégation belge. Ensuite, euh, donc, il y a la traduction anglais-français en place pour ceux qui, euh, qui veulent euh, avoir une, une traduction. Donc, M. Purser, après, il, il fera son speech en anglais et M. Bilchon, il fera son, son speech en français. Euh, maintenant, euh, il y a un deuxième changement, c'est que la délégation des Pays-Bas, ils sont toujours dans l'avion. Donc, ils, ont, ils auront du retard. Donc, M. Van Opstelten, il va probablement, euh, disons, venir euh, peut-être en fin de matinée. Ce qui fait qu'on va probablement prendre M. Purser tout de suite après le discours de M. Bilchen. Euh, voilà. Sinon, euh, vous voudrez aussi trouver euh, la stratégie euh, sur la cybersécurité que M. Bilchen va proposer dans quelques instants euh, dans la brochure qu'on vous a distribuée lors de l'enregistrement. Et euh, voilà, donc euh, j'aurai encore l'une ou l'autre information par après. Et je voudrais euh, donc euh, donner le mot euh, à notre ministre de la Justice, M. François Bilchen. Voilà, merci M. Hutch. M. Hutch, euh, son premier grand événement, M. Hutch vient d'être désigné il y a quelques mois seulement comme le monsieur certes gouvernemental au Luxembourg, donc vous le verrez encore. Son, votre Excellence, M. l'ambassadeur Hux, cher secrétaire général adjoint du Benelux, Alain de Musère, chers collègues, en attendant mon ami Ivo Obstelten, c'est pour moi un très grand plaisir de vous accueillir à Luxembourg pour cette conférence sur la cybersécurité. Conférence qui est à placer dans le cercle des euh, conférences Benelux sur la cybersécurité, mais qui me permet aussi de vous présenter la stratégie cybersécurité euh, du Luxembourg. Ce sont des sujets qui sont toujours actuels. Pas plus tard qu'hier, j'ai appris par la presse qu'une attaque a été lancée contre une centrale des eaux aux États-Unis. 
Il y a quelques jours, la presse a révélé que des entreprises norvégiennes ont été victimes d'attaques d'une certaine envergure. Fin octobre, la presse nippone a rapporté que des ordinateurs de plusieurs missions diplomatiques japonaises à l'étranger et du Parlement à Tokyo ont été la cible de cyberattaques. Il y en a beaucoup d'autres et Ivo Van Opstelten va aussi en parler euh, d'événements de, de, aux Pays-Bas. L'actualité du sujet se traduit encore par le fait que la sécurité dans le cyberespace est au cœur de nombreuses conférences, tables rondes et réflexions qui sont organisées actuellement, que ce soit dans les enceintes multilatérales, voire européennes, ou dans un contexte plus vaste, mondial, comme en témoigne la conférence qui a lieu à Londres début novembre 2011 et qui a réuni des experts à travers le monde entier, y compris le Luxembourg. La conférence d'aujourd'hui, qui est aussi une conférence internationale, se propose de traiter non pas de la cybersécurité dans son ensemble, dans toute sa complexité politique et technique, mais elle met l'accent sur la coopération. Elle s'inscrit de ce fait dans un cadre, celui justement de la coopération Benelux, qui a été lancé par mon collègue Ivo Obstelten, qui a lancé la première conférence, voici six mois, à Maastricht, le 5 avril 2011. Il faut d'ailleurs dire que l'idée était née lors d'un petit déjeuner des ministres de la justice Benelux, nous prenons toujours le petit déjeuner ensemble, soit à Bruxelles, soit à Luxembourg, avant une réunion, et c'est comme ça que l'idée était née, comme on découvrait que tous les trois, Iwop Stelten, Stéphane de Klerk et moi, étions tous les trois responsables de la politique de la cybersécurité, de travailler davantage ensemble. Stéphane a pris la relève et à l'occasion de l'inauguration du Belgian Cybercrime of Excellence for Training, Research and Education Center, avait invité ses collègues à Bruxelles pour continuer les débats sur ce sujet. La dernière conférence a eu lieu le 30 juin 2011 à euh, La Haye, et puis on a dit au Luxembourg, il faut quand même qu'on sorte, euh, sorte aussi de nos trous et qu'on montre qu'on est up to date et c'est ce qu'on fait aujourd'hui. Voilà pourquoi la date d'aujourd'hui n'est pas le fruit du hasard. En effet, le gouvernement avait déjà prévu dans sa déclaration gouvernementale qu'il fallait euh, protéger les infrastructures de communication et d'information qui aujourd'hui exigent tant une protection physique qu'une protection virtuelle, notamment contre les cyberattaques et les actes relevant du domaine de la cybercriminalité. Dans le domaine virtuel, je cite la déclaration gouvernementale, il y a lieu d'accélérer, d'étendre et de systématiser les initiatives prises à ce jour pour protéger tant les infrastructures publiques que privées. En juillet 2011, le gouvernement est passé à l'acte et a décidé de se doter d'une stratégie en matière de sécurité dans le domaine des infrastructures et systèmes de communication et de traitement de l'information. Nous nous sommes donc dotés tout d'abord d'une structure organisationnelle. En haut, responsable de la stratégie, il y a le board, le Cyber Security Board. C'est un organe informel composé des ministères concernés, l'économie, la justice, l'intérieur, la défense, la recherche, l'économie, les affaires étrangères, la fonction publique et les communications. Ce board informel est rattaché au Premier ministre et est présidé par le ministre des Communications. Pourquoi le ministre des Communications Parce que, je ne cesse de le répéter à toutes les conférences, euh, le ministre des Communications est également ministre de la Justice, et ministre de la Recherche et ministre de la Fonction publique. Donc il y a des tas de domaines euh, que je connais assez bien, et en plus le ministre des Communications dépend du Premier ministre, ce qui fait qu'on a décidé que ce board allait être présidé, non pas seulement virtuellement, mais physiquement, euh, chaque fois par le ministre euh, euh, des communications. Bien entendu, il y a également une salle opé opérative, c'est le CERT gouvernemental qui est donc dirigé par M. Patrick Kutsch. La mission du BORT est double, élaborer une stratégie et veiller à la mise en œuvre de celle-ci. Le premier volet de la mission est maintenant accompli. Le Cyber Security Board a entamé des réflexions afin d'identifier les grands axes d'une stratégie dont le but sera triple. Premièrement, assurer un fonctionnement sans faille de nos infrastructures de communication, car il facilite un nombre croissant d'activités des citoyens, des entreprises et des administrations. Deuxièmement, garantir la croissance de notre économie digitale, ainsi que le développement de nos secteurs porteurs de croissance, comme le secteur financier, qui est étroitement lié à un environnement technologique performant, 
surtout depuis l'émergence du cloud computing et comme aussi le secteur des télécoms et euh, des nouvelles technologies. Troisièmement, assurer la continuité de l'approvisionnement dans les secteurs vitaux, comme celui de l'énergie, de l'électricité, de l'eau, de la santé, car il est indéniable que tout dysfonctionnement, toute interruption pourrait avoir des conséquences désastreuses pour la sécurité et la santé publique. Pas plus tard que vendredi dernier, le gouvernement a entériné la proposition de stratégie élaborée et adoptée préalablement par le Cyber Security Board, stratégie qui vous a été remise dans vos documentations. En adoptant cette stratégie, le Luxembourg se dote d'un outil indispensable pour renforcer la sécurité des réseaux et des autres infrastructures. Ainsi, nous répondons aussi à l'invitation de la commissaire Nelly Kreuss, qui a rappelé à l'attention des États membres les objectifs identifiés par la communication sur les infrastructures de la Commission européenne, infrastructures critiques de la Commission européenne de 2009. Parallèlement, le gouvernement a décidé de créer le CERT, Computer Emergency Response Team, le CERT gouvernemental, donc dirigé par M. Huch. Qu'est-ce que c'est qu'un CERT Un CERT, CERT c'est le pompier des nouvelles technologies. Il doit intervenir lorsqu'il y a le feu, mais surtout, il doit prévenir le feu par mieux vaut prévenir le feu que de devoir intervenir, parce que toute intervention d'un pompier laisse malheureusement euh, des dommages. Voilà pourquoi ce CERT est très important. Alors, quel est maintenant, euh, quel est, quels sont maintenant les grands axes de notre stratégie Premièrement, assurer la protection des infrastructures. Nous avons à la fois une approche offensive et une approche défensive. Approche offensive veut dire anticiper et prévenir les incidents. Et bien entendu, le cercle gouvernemental n'est pas le seul à pouvoir le faire. Il faut instaurer une vieille technologique afin de pouvoir comprendre les nouveaux types d'incidents et d'attaques, les détecter en temps utile. Il faut analyser les technologies et les systèmes afin d'identifier les vulnérabilités et les failles éventuelles. Il faut mettre en place des systèmes de détection et de prévention d'intrusion au niveau des infrastructures et systèmes sensibles. Voilà pourquoi euh, j'aimerais insister, ce peuple en parlera, sur l'importance de l'ENISA, l'Agence européenne chargée de la sécurité des réseaux et de l'information, qui, elle, est en train de coordonner toute cette coopération en Europe. Et puis, d'une façon générale, il faut améliorer l'état de préparation de notre pays et de ses entreprises et citoyens pour augmenter notre capacité de résistance. Côté offensif, côté défensif, il faut intervenir et réagir. La grande complexité des incidents de sécurité et leur dispersion internationale demande aux équipes en charge des compétences technologiques pointues et un réseau relationnel national et international efficace. Souvent, la maîtrise d'un incident dépend de l'intervention concertée de plusieurs acteurs et l'on comprend que les services internes des entreprises, qui sont moins souvent confrontés à des incidents, sont alors dépassés et souhaiteraient pouvoir se tourner vers des acteurs compétents et fiables. Les CERT, ou encore appelés CSIRT, Computer Security Incident Response Team, on jongle dans les appellations que plus personne ne comprend, répondent à cette attente. Ce sont des équipes spécialisées dans la résolution et la gestion d'incidents de sécurité informatique. À ce sujet, au Luxembourg, nous disposons en fait de trois CERT. Le CERT gouvernemental, dont je viens de parler, mais aussi le CERT recherche et éducation, RESTENA, qui, euh, et puis le CERT orienté vers les PME et les personnes privées qu'on appelle CIRCLE, au Luxembourg, Computer Incident Response Center Luxembourg. Chacun de ces CERT a un rayon d'action déterminé et a une connaissance approfondie des particularités des systèmes d'information utilisés par les différents secteurs. Là encore, la coopération est primordiale et j'espère que les équipes s'associent et unissent leurs efforts et leurs forces, que ce soit au niveau de l'anticipation, de la détection, de la réaction ou de l'intervention. Réaliser des exercices et simulations sectorielles et nationaux portant sur la réaction en cas d'incident affectant la sécurité des systèmes d'information et des communications sensibles ou critiques et participer aux exercices européens pan, pan européens, c'est une des activités que nous sommes en train de développer. Et puis, bien entendu, il faut avoir un plan d'urgence en cas d'incident majeur pour intervenir et il ne faut pas oublier que la Commission européenne est en train 
d'élaborer un plan d'urgence européen en cas d'incident informatique fondé sur des plans nationaux. Deuxième grand axe, c'est la veille juridique. Il est incontournable de compléter notre volet offensif et défensif euh, par une veille juridique. Actuellement, nous disposons déjà d'un certain nombre d'instruments pour punir et sanctionner ceux qui attaquent, accèdent intentionnellement et sans autorisation et commettent des actes d'instruction dans les systèmes informatiques. Dans ce contexte, j'aimerais signaler que la Commission européenne a lancé une proposition de directive sur la cybercriminalité. Nous avons trouvé au sein du Conseil des ministres de la Justice une approche générale en juin 2011 et des discussions sur cette base seront entamées prochainement avec le Parlement européen. Permettez-moi cependant de vous dire que même si j'ai adhéré à cette approche commune, j'ai été un peu désappointé par nos résultats. La proposition initiale de la Commission était beaucoup plus ambitieuse et j'avais l'impression qu'un certain nombre de nos collègues, ministres de la Justice, ne sont pas conscients de cette cybercriminalité. Bien entendu, ça reste ma devise, mieux vaut anticiper que réagir, euh, mais si, lorsque on doit réagir, il faut pouvoir bien réagir, il faut donc un droit pénal assez efficace et harmonisé en Europe pour nous permettre de réagir. Encore une fois, anticiper c'est mieux, j'ai pris l'image du sapeur-pompier, euh, parce que, je le sais en tant que juriste et ministre de la justice, le criminel devance toujours le policier et devance de loin le juge. Donc, anticipant pour ne pas devoir rép euh, réprimer, mais s'il faut réprimer, il faut avoir un meilleur droit européen qu'on a actuellement. Encore que cette directive sera un léger pas en avant. Cette veille juridique nous permettra aussi d'évaluer si notre droit est encore adapté aux nouvelles réalités et à défaut d'initier les adaptations nécessaires. Je vous donne un exemple. Nous sommes en train de préparer au Luxembourg le cloud computing. Or, le cloud computing, d'une part, donnera un avantage certain, par exemple à notre place financière, si elle est une première à se lancer dans le cloud computing, mais elle demandera, ce cloud computing demandera un certain nombre de sécurité, non seulement technique, mais également juridique. L'exemple que j'aimerais vous citer et qui intéresse à ce stade le ministre de la Justice, c'est celui de savoir à qui appartient, en cas de faillite d'une entreprise, non pas les ordinateurs qui sont dans l'entreprise, mais les données sur l'ordinateur de l'entreprise. C'est une question très importante que nous sommes en train d'attaquer dans le cadre de la réforme du droit de faillite au Luxembourg. On voit donc que la veille juridique ne concerne pas seulement le droit pénal, mais connaît un certain autre nombre de volets juridiques. Troisième axe de la stratégie, et c'est pour ça que nous sommes ici, c'est la coopération tant nationale qu'internationale. Nos collègues étrangers présents dans cette salle me rejoignent certainement lorsque je souligne que sans coopération, toutes nos actions seront d'avance vouées à l'échec. Nos réseaux de communication sont reliés avec les infrastructures internationales, Internet est par essence global et les incidents ne s'arrêtent pas aux frontières, ni aux frontières nationales, ni aux frontières européennes. J'ai parlé de la place financière, je peux aussi parler de l'Europe. Nous sommes une capitale européenne et il y a énormément de data centers européens qui sont disséminés sur notre territoire. Voilà pourquoi nous avons retenu le sujet de la coopération comme thème porteur de notre conférence. Coopérer veut aussi dire échange d'informations. Coopérer veut dire les structures appelées à collaborer doivent se connaître. Et si je dis structure, en fait, je dis les têtes, à la tête des structures. Et voilà pourquoi, depuis un an, nous avons essayé de mettre en commun les différentes têtes qui s'occupent dans les trois pays des différents réseaux. Quatrième axe et je crois qu'il est encore et toujours important, c'est celui de la sensibilisation, de l'information, de l'éducation et de la formation de tout le monde. Du jeune, la personne âgée, des PME, des grandes entreprises, de l'État. Je me rappelle, l'année 2000, j'étais pour la première fois ministre des communications, j'avais mis en œuvre une stratégie qui s'appelait e-Luxembourg, y e comprenait entre autres les Internetstufen. Des Internet Stufen où on voulait même dans le village le plus euh, remote au Luxembourg, le, le plus éloigné, donner un accès aux ordinateurs, un accès à Internet à tout le monde. 
C'était un volet, d'avoir partout un accès à Internet. Le deuxième volet, c'était sensibiliser les gens, leur, les préparer à ce qu'on appelait le permis de conduire Internet. C'était quelque chose de très important. Aujourd'hui, on voit que c'est plutôt le learning by doing qui se fait. Néanmoins, 43% des gens interrogés au Luxembourg et qui surfent, nous sommes numéro un en ce qui concerne de surfer sur Internet, 83% disent avoir été formés, 57% n'ont pas été formés. J'aimerais aussi évoquer les campagnes de l'initiative euh, CASIS, euh, qui dépend du ministère de l'économie et qui a fait énormément de travail, notamment auprès des jeunes, et vous verrez au workshop également euh, CASIS. Et puis, euh, avec CASIS et avec le Centre des technologies et de l'information de l'État, qui dépend du ministère de la fonction publique, nous avons comme premier axe, euh, premier plan d'action du Cyber Security Board, nous avons décidé d'offrir dans tous les ministères une information pour tous les fonctionnaires, comment bien agir avec les ordinateurs, avec les mobile phones et tous les autres instruments modernes, parce que quelquefois ce qui est pratique n'est pas toujours très sûr. Et il faut savoir que l'État est vulnérable si ceux qui travaillent pour l'État, et je commence par les ministres, ne savent pas manier les dangers que comporte le maniement de ces nouveaux instruments. Voilà pourquoi une, un des premiers axes sera la formation de tous les fonctionnaires et agents de l'État. Je crois que ce sera aussi une bonne chose pour l'ensemble du pays, parce que les agents de l'État sont très souvent des pères et mères. Donc si les pères et mères sont bien formés de par leur travail, ils seront aussi plus conscients de ce qui se passe dans leur maison avec leur, euh, leurs enfants. Encore une fois, Internet est toujours comparé à une autoroute. Sur une route, il faut... Euh, il faut se conduire comme conducteur responsable, ça vaut aussi pour les utilisateurs d'Internet. Dernier axe, c'est l'établissement de normes et standards, non pas nécessairement par le biais de la loi, mais par le biais de critères informels qui sont diffusés dans les différentes, euh, différentes instances. Bien entendu, ces axes sont toujours en interaction, et bien entendu, les acteurs externes ne doivent pas être oubliés. J'ai parlé de la place financière, euh, j'aimerais aussi parler de la recherche. La recherche ne fait pas en elle-même partie de la stratégie, mais elle est un facteur qui permettra de réaliser les objectifs. Nous avons au Luxembourg une université jeune, mais efficace, et dont un des centres d'excellence, c'est le centre interdisciplinaire Security, Reliability and Trust. Ce centre est en train de développer une véritable école doctorale de jeunes gens qui travaillent sur ces sujets. Comme chez nos voisins en Belgique et aux Pays-Bas, nous avons donc cherché, nous continuons à chercher une bonne collaboration avec euh, l'université. J'ai parlé de l'anticipation. Nous connaissons, nous, nous, avons, nous essayons toujours d'apprendre de, euh, de, des erreurs des autres. Euh, parce que ce n'est qu'en faisant des erreurs où on apprend, mais la vie est trop courte pour faire toutes les erreurs soi-même, donc il faut savoir apprendre des erreurs des autres. Mais il faut encore mieux pouvoir anticiper les erreurs éventuelles et d'où justement l'intérêt de la recherche. Mesdames, Messieurs, vous constaterez donc que notre stratégie n'est pas encore dotée d'énormément de plans d'action. Ils vont venir au fur et à mesure. En janvier, nous allons lancer les trois premiers plans d'action, dont celui de la formation des fonctionnaires. D'autres suivront, puisque toute stratégie doit pouvoir être en évolution. On n'est jamais fini, on n'a jamais ter terminé avec une élaboration d'une bonne stratégie, et c'est pour ça que je crois que l'information, l'échange entre tous est quelque chose de très important, et je me réjouis donc de cette euh, conférence, et j'espère qu'elle nous donnera beaucoup de résultats, même si je vous quitterai en début d'après-midi, sous condition que les nuages se dissipent et que je pourrai m'envoler pour Munich. Merci et bonne conférence. ENISA is the European Network and Information Security Agency. We're a very young agency. We were born in 2004. We're also a very small agency. We're only 60 people big. And of that, my role in the agency is I run all the operational activities. And I only have 35 people. So why do I tell you this? Because it means we have to work in a certain way. Um, my function, if you like, within the agency, I have to do two things. Well, three things, actually. I have to come to conferences like this and, and uh, animate and, and, and make sure that people know about the agency. But essentially, 
Uh, the job of my team is to, to liaise with stakeholders and make sure that the work plan represents your interests. And secondly, to make sure that we deliver what's in the work plan. Okay, and I think the first one is at least as important as the second. Because, you know, if we're not delivering the right things, what good are we doing? So I attach a lot of importance on talking to people like yourself. So my department's 35 people strong, and that means we have to work in a certain way. And the way we work is we form virtual teams taken from people like yourself, and you are the people who actually do the work. We, of course, do a lot of guiding project management. We facilitate, and of course, we have the expertise. But it's important to realize that Anissa's deliverables are the community's deliverables. And the way um, we want to push Anissa in the future is much more in this direction, enabling communities, bringing communities together so that you can learn from each other on a cross-border basis. Yeah? You can't do too much with 35 experts, no matter how good they are. And we're one of the only European agencies, if, if not the only, that actually has this in its mandate. And we attach a lot of importance in aligning goals and strategies of public and private sector. This is really one of the keys for uh, a, secure Europe in, a secure Europe in the future. So I won't talk too much about Anissa. You'll hear about Anissa through the slides I'm going to present, and I'll try and give you a feeling for what we do and how we do it. But first of all, cybersecurity, what is it? It's a bit of a buzzword, actually. Um, you know, cybersecurity, I hear it everywhere these days. Uh, my perspective on this is it's not so different from information security. So a lot of what we've already done is already valid. Well, it, most of what we've done, if not all, is already valid. Cybersecurity is just a different way of looking at things. From a technical perspective, therefore, there is very little that separates classical information security from cybersecurity. I think it's important to bear this in mind because if we don't, the danger is we'll rush off and start trying to reinvent the wheel uh, all over the place. And this is a very wasteful activity and it's absolutely not necessary. Okay? Cybersecurity is about securing data and systems in the global environment. So we're putting on a different pair of glasses. We are saying, of course, the same things apply. Of course, we need information security. But here, we're really looking at things from an international global perspective, which is why you won't see many companies, I think, with a cyber security officer. You'll have a good old information security officer, mostly. Sometimes you will, yeah? For large conglomerates, this may well be a good thing to do. Um, it's the perspective that changes. And adopting this point of view, cyber security is, by definition, a global concern. And that's the key to a lot of, well, it's certainly the key to this conference, of which we've already heard. It's also what's going wrong, I think, in, in uh, European security and indeed in international security. There is not enough collaboration, and I'll give you several examples of that, and I'll also give you some ideas on how Anissa thinks we can, we can become better at this. But the, the thought I would like to leave you here is that due to the nature of the problem, advances in cybersecurity are more likely to be achieved through political co cooperation and collaboration, which is why today's initiative is extremely, um, an extremely positive development. I think Luxembourg, in any case, is doing very well in the information security area. You have things like banking secrecy since years. You know, the, there's a lot of history of security and privacy in the country. But of course, you know, it's still necessary to liaise with others and find out what they're doing and learn from mistakes and indeed to pass on your experience to other people too. So this, this is really the key towards moving forward. But the basics are still valid. And this is back to my comment, it's really easy, it would be really easy to reinvent the wheel. I already saw, I sat in a high level meeting with Malmstrom and two other commissioners in February and was a little bit alarmed to hear that one of the things that came out that was a new standards initiative on cyber security. Now it may be a good thing, I'm not saying it isn't, but you know, what exactly is a cybersecurity standard and why does it differ from an information security standard? So it may be a good thing, but we need to think about these things very carefully and make sure that we're not just producing new standards that, that are competing with the old ones for no reason. So what we have learned remains valid. It's still all about securing how people interact with process and technology. And whereas I used to say that people were the weakest link, I now believe that process is the weakest link. I can give you many, many examples in security, I see some heads nodding, where process is the weakest thing. Let me just give you one example. So those of you who know me know that you know, I was 18 years as a chief information security officer in various institutions, so I really have frontline experience. Um, all over the world, you see examples of people putting systems in place and then not administrating them. Example, the intrusion detection system that rings bells all day and no one goes to look. And if they do go to look, do they look on the system which is supposed to have been attacked? You know, this is spending a lot of money and getting no benefit from it. 
So it's very careful that we are coherent in security. And here I'll mention a principle to you. Two words. Um, efficiency and effectiveness. The whole world is on an efficiency drive. OPEX reduction, saving costs, etc. So efficiency is doing the thing right. But if you're not doing the right thing, which is effectiveness, you can be as efficient as you like. You're not getting anywhere because you're doing the wrong thing. Yeah, so process is incredibly important and sometimes I think we concentrate far too much on technology and we don't think about the other two elements in the chain and certainly not the process chain. I can really say that at the European level, process is the issue and I'll give you some examples of this. So fundamental principles still apply, defense in depth, the need for end-to-end -end security, the same methods and tools will be used, we have good risk management methods, we have a lot of good work that's been done in control for own works, etc., etc. I terminate with what I've said several times. There's a risk of reinventing the wheel. Let's not fall into it. Now, this is easy to appreciate, although there are still some tricks here. International collaboration, I've just said that's a lot of what it's all about. So everyone these days realizes, I think, that you cannot do security within national boundaries. Not entirely. That's why we have this conference today. Ironically enough, you see a lot of people saying, yes, we can do security within European boundaries. This is not true either. Yeah? And I think the, right, the, the correct way to put the statement is that you can do both as long as you take account of the global situation. So when we do security in national boundaries, we look at what's happening within Europe and the rest of the world. When we do security in European boundaries, we take a lot of notice of what our big global partners are doing and make sure you know, that we're, we're roughly aligned with the way they're doing things. Otherwise, we'll just trip over each other's feet. So, can't secure information system in national boundaries, not within European boundaries either, so what do we have to do? Well, I think in order to respond successfully to this need, Europe has to solve two similar issues. It has to achieve a coherent policy approach within its borders, and it has to achieve a policy approach that's aligned with the goals of its international partners, and sometimes this is very difficult. Think of privacy issues and the way the state deals with them, which is totally different. So we have the Safe Harbor Agreement, which is a start, but we're having even more strict laws coming up in the very near future in Europe. This is a challenge. How are we going to do this? This is the one that people tend to miss. The Treaty of Lisbon opened the door to breaking down what was known as the old pillar system. The old pillar system is a sort of Euro-speak uh, term for how people used to work in silos. So we had the open market community, we had the defense community, we had the law and order community. Now, if you like, everyone can speak to each other. And I don't know if you've noticed it, but on a lot of conferences that I go to, the three communities are mixing very strongly, which is a great thing. I talked to a counterpart in NATO, and I was telling him about the pan-European cybersecurity exercise, which I mentioned to you, and he said, oh, we did one of those. Great, so why didn't we know about it, and why don't you know about ours? This is anti-synergy. This is economically inefficient, yeah? So breaking down barriers between communities, I think, is even more important than breaking down barriers between countries. And it's happening. The risk is that if we don't do it in a correct way, that it's politically structured and that the interfaces are controlled, then we'll have a mess. So it's good to talk to other people as long as you do so in the right way. And I'll give you an example of that in a minute. We need to align the goals and approaches of these communities, public domain, commercial, military, laws and enforcement, intelligence, and it goes on. This is where you can really see the problems and issues. If you look at governance of the internet, internet security, etc., all over the world, we're in a transition phase. One example, the ITU, which is the old CCITT, which was essentially a standards organization, received a mandate from the United Nations to do cybersecurity. That's a bit strange. I, I think it's not a bad thing, but it's, it's not something you would have predicted. You have the IGF, which is under a lot of debate at the moment about the role of the IGF. You have the OECD, you have ICANN. You have all these associations all competing in some sense on you know, how they're going to affect the future area of cybersecurity. So governance, I think, will be a key issue within the EU and internationally. And if we don't get this right, the risk is, again, that people will contradict each other and the everyday, you know, the, the, the everyday worker who has to implement the results will not get clear guidance. So the question is, how do we decide, decide who does what? 
And unfortunately, I can't, of course, give you a magic answer. If I could, I would perhaps be a lot higher in the commission than I am uh, or in the, the, the system. Um, the point is that this is something that needs to be sorted out through a lot of political uh, discussions and um, it's, a complex affair. it's a complex affair. <clears throat> Another thing I think you need to take account of increasingly, whatever your perspective and whatever your community, is what instruments are available in this area. So, here I list a few high-level policy statements such as the digital agenda and the internal security strategy, European directives, which are then transposed into national laws, national laws themselves, which may come about either as a result of transposing a directive or not, standards produced by international European and national standards organizations, good practice, awareness, etc. If you like, they're structured from quite um, binding statements right down to very loose uh, instruments. And I think the trick is to use all these things sensibly and appropriately. I don't think anyone wants to see European directives that stifle competition and that create a situation in which European companies are not competitive relative to their international counterparts. This is extremely important and it would be so easy to do in security. So directives are, are sort of big, slow-moving instruments that you have to be very careful with and get right. They also have to be at the right level of abstraction. At the bottom end, you have things like good practice, which are very fluid instruments, which you can use because you know they work, because they, they have been produced and they are operational, and you can share between members of the community. Now, ANESA positions itself as being complementary to the Commission, much more at the bottom end of this scale. We do have input into strategy and directives, but we really prefer to work closer to the communities, resolving implementation issues and practical day-to-day -day problems. Two words which are very important, consistency and coherence. Everyone gets the coherence aspect, very few get the consistency aspect. So European approach to information security must be coherent geographically and consistent over time, and both are equally important. So a coherent approach ensures that you don't get pockets of risk, there's no weakest link. This is very easy to understand. What is somewhat more subtle, I think, is that if you do not have an approach which is consistent over time, you don't build to greater levels of maturity. And we see this all the while in many different communities. For instance, the, the private sector. If you move into a merger or an acquisition, the tendency is to sort of put everything into question and then start again. Uh, if you're lucky, you know the models survive and you get some degree of, uh, uh, of compatibility and you can move forward. But you really need to make sure in security that you have this in the system because security is built very slowly. So coherence and consistency are really important and it's clear that in order to achieve these goals, Europe will need to define a clear strategy and an associated roadmap. And this is ongoing and indeed uh, we see many countries, Luxembourg included, with a cybersecurity strategy we will be seeing something at the European level quite soon, I believe. Cybercrime. This is a very important document, if you don't know it, the Internal Security Strategy. It's not one of the best known ones. It's very interesting in what it says. It's the EU Internal Security Strategy, and it tells you a lot about how cybercrime will be handled, amongst other things. I'm just going to give you a very brief overview and invite you to look at it later because I think it's, it's very good in the way it explains things. So I picked out two objectives to talk to you about because ANISA is involved in these. Objective one is disrupting international crime networks, which concentrates on increased cooperation with law enforcement, common definitions of criminal offenses and sanctions, and it defines three concrete actions, which I can't remember off the top of my head. Again, I'll point you to the document. Objective three, we are involved in this, objective one. Objective three, as even more interesting, um, because this is about raising levels of security for citizens and businesses in cyberspace, and this is ANISA's core business, of course. So here we're very involved. We're referenced several times in the document, and we are asked to do specific things. Uh, the second one uh, establishes the Cyber Crime Center by 2013. I'm sure you know about this, which will work in collaboration with Europol, and will also, uh, Commissioner Marstrom has asked that it works in collaboration with ANISA. And I've been over to Europol a few times since, it's, uh, since uh, this statement came out. Last time I was over there with the director about six weeks ago. So we are starting to exchange information and work together, and we are working on a common memorandum of understanding. And incidentally, Anissa is doing the same thing with Interpol. Now, having said that, please bear in mind that cybercrime is at the edge of Anissa's mandate, and we have to be very careful how we do it, because subsidiarity is a key issue here. We do not want to, to even appear to be taking over the responsibilities of sovereign states. And it's, it, it's very sensitive. 
So in the initial work program 2011, we have this work package which is just completing actually. Good practice for certs, you heard what certs are, to address NIS issues of, of cybercrime. Look how it's worded. You cannot imagine how much time went into just wording this work package title, which shows you, I think, how politically sensitive the whole thing are. The objectives are um, to improve the capability of certs to liaise with law and order and to support them in what they're doing. So we do not have a direct connection with law and order in, in anything to do with response. Production of a good practice guide for certs in, in these aspects, and we also held a workshop which was extremely successful uh, on certs and the NIS aspects of cybercrime. So the message I want to leave you with is, yes, we are in collaboration with the various instances. We do work together, but we are by no means the drivers when, when we talk about cybercrime rather than cybersecurity. Cybersecurity, by the way, INISA uses as the global framework. So cybersecurity means pretty much everything of which cybercrime is one part. Right, let's go on to the core of this um, talk, the CIIP Action Plan. Uh, very, very important European instrument, a lot of uh, work going into it. To give you an idea of the INISA operational budget, about 50% goes into this area. So let's start with the Commission's CIIP communication. Long-sounding long name, unfortunately. Protecting Europe from large-scale cyber attacks and disruptions, enhancing preparedness, security, and resilience. Published on 30th of March 2009. Now, um, I was at the ministerial conference that followed this in Tallinn in April 2009. It was really a very interesting experience because you could really see the political buy-in. Yeah, so Reading cheered it, Commissioner Reading cheered it, but as it went round the table, it was really very, very positive, and there was a high degree of political support for this. Two things caught the imagination of the, the group, both of which materialized and are doing quite well. One is the thing called the European Public Private Partnership for Resilience, which I'm going to talk to you about, but the big one was pan European cybersecurity exercises. <laughs> as you probably know, we've done the first one, and we're well on the way to the second. So, and indeed, I'll talk about these things a bit later. This communication strengthens the role of ANISA. All the activities are within the scope of the European Programme for Critical Infrastructure Protection. Note, infrastructure protection and not information infrastructure protection. Okay, so this is much more global in scope. Proposes five areas or pillars of action of which ANISA is explicitly called upon to contribute to three. Globally, this is going extremely well. And that is, um, if you like, a statement of the, the buy-in of the member states you know, much less of INISA, of course we did, I think we're doing a good job here, but of course it's the member states who make the difference. Yes, yeah? so the member states themselves are putting a lot of effort into this and it's paying off. So what is the role of INISA? We proactively support member states in achieving the objectives of this plan, but member states must take the lead. And we always work like this. I myself chaired uh, most of the meetings in the first half of the pan-European exercise project, and you know, and this is suggests things, but it's the member states who take the decisions. This is key. This is sovereignty, subsidiarity. Um, we assist member states in the planning process. We set up mechanisms to facilitate the establishment and day-to-day -day running of key instruments such as the EP3R. And we provide a lot of input in terms of analysis, best practice, uh, facts, etc. So what are these instruments? Um, the European Forum for Member States is a very interesting one. So I go to every meeting. Uh, and I have to say, it's an extremely practical and extremely productive forum. This is not a chit-chat forum. This is really where decisions get made, and it converges very strongly. And I think this is a great message to be able to pass to people like yourselves, because I think sometimes the communities you know, have an image of talking, and you know, we have comitology, and uh, there's lots of talk, etc. This is really a very practical forum. Um, it gets together decision makers from the member states to decide on issues on CIIP, which then at the European level, the Commission and people like ourselves act upon. It's also used to foster a common understanding of the issues and strategies for dealing with them. So we do the same sort of things, promoting good practices, assisting the Commission, etc., etc., etc. But please be aware of this forum. Of course, Luxembourg has representatives. I believe it's Francois Thiel, uh, who's your representative here. Um, this is a very, very good forum. Now, in partnership with this, we have uh, the EP3R. This is a totally different sort of animal. It's, as far as I know, um, one of the only public-private partnerships that are Europe-wide. Now, think about this. Public-private partnerships are known to be difficult because of the trust-building element. 
And we know we build trust in small groups. And we know that it's a very personal affair. These are the facts of dealing with public-private partnerships. Yeah? The smallest partnership you can have in Europe is 27 by definition, and that's you know, not even considering the variety of organizations, etc. So this is a major challenge. Um, it's going reasonably well. I would like to see a lot of things change here, to be quite honest, and we're continually thinking about how to make it better. But it's a very operational community. In the beginning, we spent a lot of time talking about governance, and then suddenly we thought, no, let's stop this. Let's do something practical, and the thing will kick off. And indeed, that's what happened. So now we have three work groups working in this area, all working on concrete problems, all producing deliverables. Now, if in the coffee break, if you catch me, I'll tell you some of the things where we need to improve. But this is open to pretty much everybody who has a role in resilience. And I invite anyone who's interested to either speak to me or contact Anissa or indeed the Commission to see if and how you could contribute. Now, I want to talk a bit longer about this. This is really very, very interesting. This is the first pan-European exercise of cybersecurity. So think of Cyberstorm in the States. This is the European equivalent, yeah? Um, extremely successful activity by the member states, which I'll tell you about. But the first question you should ask me is, what the hell are we testing? I think the minister mentioned we do not have actually a pan-European contingency plan. So we don't have anything to test. So we turn the ball around and we say, let's use the test to see how we'd react anyway, and let's create pockets of policy which we can then slot into a framework. This is one of the chief instruments for moving towards this plan. Now, the measures tested, this was performed in 2010, we tested three things. If you had a cyber security tomorrow, let's say we're in Luxembourg, and let's say the attack came from, I don't know, Ireland, just an example, who do you phone? Sounds simple, right? It's not. <laughs> who do you pick up the phone? Second point, even more complex, what is your understanding of their mandate and decision-making power? Because here's the scenario. You pick up the phone, you talk for half an hour, and then you find out the person at the other end can't help you. In a crisis, that's not very good. <laughs> Yet you really need to know you're talking to the right person. Now, half an hour is valuable time in the heat of an emergency. Thirdly, what channels do you use to, to share what type of information? Test carried out on 4th of November 2010. Um, very successful. We learned a lot. It sounds simple, but I told you the process was the weakest link. Believe me, it's not. We learned an awful lot here. Scenario was used, uh, not the focus of the test, but was used to support the test. It was based on a cyber incident affecting large-scale IP networks with cross-country impact. We had to assume that the uh, telephone network was up because we used it in the test. So it was called a distributed tabletop. We had people sitting in Athens, but we were in connections with all the member states over the phone. And that's how we did the test. It was 360-something injects, 70 organizations, 150 experts. But look at the participation. All 27 member states and three EFTA countries. Fantastic. And that was the real achievement of this exercise, was building the group, building the trust. And I now think that this group is ideally positioned to go on and do more sophisticated things. And indeed, Cyberstorm contacted us a long while ago. We're in coordination with them. NATO contacted us, etc. So it's generated a lot of interest and a lot of communication and collaboration is already going on. Findings are published on the website. I won't go over them in too much detail, but they're structured as followed. Planning a structure, building trust, understanding points of contact, plus a set of recommendations. Please check out the INISA website. There's some very, very practical material there. It's all free, of course. Um, you'd be surprised how sometimes we really go into detail. Not always, because it's not always appropriate, but there are some very, very practical lessons learnt in that report. Now, last week or two weeks ago, we also did the first EU-US exercise, which is also a very exciting development, I think, for, for Europe. To be brutally honest with you, it was much more of a political exercise than the first one, so it wasn't as sophisticated. But then again, we only had six months to prepare it, which is not very long at all, and it was still considered as an excess. So it was, um, it was launched by um, Secretary Napolitano and uh, Commissioner Cruz in the uh, Hungarian Ministerial Conference in April. Uh, and it's exploratory in nature, so how do we engage with each other? It involved planning team with experts from 15 countries, and it was completed on the third. We're still putting together the results of this one. And indeed, I think we will see further moves in this direction. I'm just thinking if there's anything I want to say about uh, exercises before I leave them. Um, perhaps just that it's very illustrative, as I say, of where Anissa really 
tries to position itself in the scale of things we can do. So don't think we don't have input into strategy directives, etc. We do. But I like this kind of work because it's close to the communities. Right. My last subject, ENISA and CERTs, supporting the CERT community. CERTs are our frontline defense. They've been there for years. They're pretty much the only instrument we have in the response area worldwide. The danger is that we will overuse them. They are loaded with lots and lots of value-added functions. The danger is that this will distract them from the, the business of responding to incidents. So we need to be thinking about the future. How does this concept evolve? The UK have come up with warps, for instance. There are other ideas on the table. This is working very well, but we need to control it. Now, how do we do this? Well, we provide help with the establishment of new certs. We identify good practice on how to operate certs. We support training and exercises. We actually produce the training material for the cert community, and we interact very closely with FIRST, which is the worldwide network of certs. And we are physically present in some of these exercises. And we are currently working on a set of baseline capabilities for national governmental certs, which I'm going to talk about. So, we're very active in this community, and we believe that they're important, a very important part of, the, um, of the, the response equation. National governmental certs are of particular interest because of their link to policymakers. These are certs which have a political mandate and can take nationwide actions, okay, such as, if you like, shutting down networks or whatever might be appropriate. So these are good people to be talking to in a crisis. Whereas a CERT that is not national governmental CERT is certainly a youthful partner, but not necessarily um, authoritative enough to be able to do the things that you need to do. So these CERTs play a major role in protection of CIP in the member states. And um, the European Commission CIIP communication states that a well-functioning national governmental CERT in each member state is mandatory. We're very close. We have about 24 to 27, I think, and the other member states are certainly in the, in the later stages of development. So this is an example, um, and this is rather old now, they're in the old format, so it's exercise material. So based on real life examples, everything we do is due to discussion with the community. So I stress again, of course, it is ANISA work, but of course it also comes from the communities themselves. Some conclusions then. I've no idea how I'm doing for time. Hopefully I'm okay. Um, what I would like you to take away from this in terms of ANISA now is that and this is core business is to facilitate dialogue. I think this is extremely important because it's a scalability problem. If we do not, if you like, have an impact on the way the market works in terms of the different stakeholder communities, we will have failed because we're too small to do the work by ourselves. This is obvious. Yeah? So between member states, between EU institutions and member states, and between the public and private sector, we will support the Commission and member states in formulating cybersecurity policy. And we will help member states exchange information, practices, experience. We believe we are ideally placed to facilitate the information between different communities. And here I really want to stress it because we must get this right. Communities are the key for the future. Breaking down the silos, making sure that we learn from each other and help each other. The bad guys have no problems in this area. Yeah? People who attack systems talk to each other all the while. So we need to talk to each other too to make sure that we, you know, we get the good practice right. And as an agency that deals extensively with good practice, we can also help industry face the day-to-day -day challenges of the changing threat environment. Now, I've only covered a fraction of what NISA does, but I've really tried to concentrate on you know, what the goals of this conference are, collaboration, and I've given some illustrative examples. Um, I hope it was useful. Uh, I don't know if we have time to take questions because I know there are other speakers lined up. I'm afraid there will not be any other speakers because unfortunately my, my colleague Eve Wolf said it has been uh, uh, yes, taken away to South America and I'm afraid it cannot uh, yes. see us today. So, uh, I can take questions if you are. So maybe we can have some questions and then big break. Um, questions or break? It's really up to you. Some questions and then a break. Not that sounds like a reasonable compromise. <laughs> I agree. Okay. So, a any questions? <clears throat> Either I told you things very well, <laughs> or you, know, you weren't interested. In no, just joking. No questions, really? Everything okay? Yep. Thank you. My, my name is Schumacher from the company Amplify. Uh, we are trying to uh, to get down the the times or that elapses from an incident to uh, to the response to, uh, with communication. 
uh, but uh, what we are looking uh, for is also sharing information uh, about the, the costs of incidents, the, not only about best practices or about the threats, but also about the costs. Uh, is ENISA active in this field? Uh, do you have some uh, links or hints to give uh, us? Thank you. I'll just start like this to write up a few We don't actually produce the material ourselves. We do know where some of this material sits and we can help. So please contact me afterwards and I will point you in the right direction. Uh, one thing I didn't mention, which may interest, may interest the audience, there are two directives out there at the moment in the area of uh, breach notifications. This is extremely important. One is a security breach notification which is Article 13A of the Telecom Friendly Note Directive, and this obliges telecommunications services to report to INISA and the Commission uh, security breaches throughout the 27 member states. Another is Article 4 of the Privacy Directive, which is when data is breached and customers are affected, then the, the re this has to be reported to the DPAs, the um, Data Protection Authorities. Now, as far as INISA is concerned, you know, what you should be asking, great, you're forcing us to give us all this data, what are you going to do with it? And what I am trying to do with the team in Anissa is, it's very early days of course, but we would like to create a pool of data that can be exploited from a neutral third party which gives you information over um, security incidents in Europe, so a cross-border view of things. And I think you know, in the long-term view of the agency, this might be a good use of us that we are a neutral third party, we do have good connections with the member states and we can provide you with this kind of information. So the future perspective is that we would like to create these pools of data and give something back to you for what you give to us. Any other questions? This is a great question. Um, so do, do we have a public database where we can see all the incidents that have happened? Um, in Anissa's work plan next year, we have a whole stream of work on the emerging threat environment. So looking at what the threats are and trying to give, if you like, a sort of top 10 threats per stakeholder community. And one of the things we want to do is, we don't actually want to do that because there are databases out there, and again, I can point you to them. Incident and technical data there are stuff out there, but you do not have the metadata, the kind of scenarios that you should be considering to do the risk analysis. And that's something that's been done many, many times, and it's wasted information. So, you know, when doing a risk analysis, and of course only you can do that because risks are particular to you, whereas threats are generic, uh, what kind of scenarios do you need to take into account and how do you interpret them? And Anissa, for this particular problem, would like to produce a knowledge base which is available to you, the community. The incidents are more with people like SAMS, with the CERT community themselves, etc. Uh, so we, th we think we'd be duplicating effort if we went down to that level of detail. But in terms of scenarios and the kind of things you should be considering, we will create a, a knowledge base and we will make it available to you. So uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Purser, for this interesting talk. Maybe I can add a point to this. Um, so when we created the GovSat, uh, when we talked about this a year ago, uh, we made a lot of use of the documents we found uh, at a NISA website. And I can say that those documents are of great quality and they are, let's say, really uh, practical documents you can use straightforward. So we made a good usage of it. Thank you. So again, we changed a bit our. Uh, je vais de nouveau switcher en français. Donc, euh, on a de nouveau changé le, le programme. Donc là, euh, la délégation euh, néerlandaise, ils, ils viennent d'arriver, et euh, on aura Monsieur euh, l'ambassadeur. Non, ils viennent pas d'arriver, mais Monsieur l'ambassadeur, Monsieur Huck. Euh, par fax, euh, son discours qu'il va donc euh, présenter maintenant. Donc, euh, je lui propose euh, de venir. Dear Damen and dear Herren, Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, uh, I represent uh, the Minister of Justice of the Netherlands, uh, Mr. Ivo Opstelter, who unfortunately could not attend today because of weather conditions. Uh, he has been, his flight has been deviated to uh, Saarbrücken. 
Nevertheless, I am delighted that we are meeting here today for a Benelux conference on cybersecurity. It's good to see that we are taking our cooperation forward. Defending critical infrastructure from cyber threats has moved fast to the top of the international policy agendas. I would like to take this opportunity to discuss a recent cyber incident in the Netherlands and share the lessons that we learned from that. We call it the Digital Notar Incident. The exchange of digital information has become a vital part of our society for both business and government transactions. This exchange, of course, has to be reliable. Digital certificates are crucial to reliable information exchange. They enable websites to prove their identity to browsers and other websites and to use digital signatures. In late August 2011, it emerged that DigiNotar, a certificate provided based on the, in the Netherlands, has been hacked. DigiNotar issued certificates for both the government and other parties, including, including law firms in the Netherlands. The hack resulted in the issue of around 530 fake certificates. We have evidence that at least one of them was used. The reliability of both the company and its certificates came under serious threat. The Dutch government revoked its trust to Digi in DigiNotar. Browser companies also took action to reject the certificates. Every certificate had to be replaced as soon as possible. Controlled migration was essential, but there were many unknown factors. Where were the certificates in use? Who could replace them? How long would the migration take? Should digital exchange be suspended for the time being? In the end, serious problems were prevented, thanks to the efforts by many organizations, both public and private. But the hack illustrates the potential of cyber attacks to disrupt society. What were the lessons learned from this? This was the first real cyber crisis to occur in the Netherlands at national level. The DigiNotar incident was a real wake-up call and it underlined the importance of the measures we were already planning. This crisis was not only about security, it was also, and that's crucial, about trust. It showed that the global certification system has its weaknesses. It is open to abuse. This surprised even insiders. The internet is an open system and it's impossible to achieve total watertight security. But we have to ensure that when problems arise, we have an adequate response. Transparency on all sides is crucial, so that immediate action can be taken in the event of a cyber incident. In the Netherlands, we are looking into compulsory yet confidential reporting of IT incidents, so that companies or government authorities under threat are informed in time and can take action. Having said that, we don't want to start regulating in this area. We want to keep the internet open and innovative. What is more, such regulations are likely to be outdated before the ink is dry. Our approach in the Netherlands is self-regulation where possible and legis legislation when needed. Another lesson we learned from this incident is that we could not have coped with this incident without working closely with private partners. After all, they have much of the required knowledge and infrastructure at their disposal. Public-private cooperation is the key to our national cybersecurity strategy. Last June, we set up a cybersecurity council. Its members are representatives of the business community, academic and government. The Council advises the government and the private sector 
on cyber security strategic issues, a role it played during this mentioned incident, the DG Notar incident. In January 2012, we will also be launching our National Cyber Security Center in the Netherlands. Here, public and private parties, universities and research centers will provide, share and analyze information on cybersecurity. They will identify and advise on new developments, on new threats and on threats. And when it is necessary, they will sound the alarm and take action. Ladies and gentlemen, allow me to conclude. First, the Digital Notar hack was a wake-up call for the Dutch government. The national infrastructure is not only vulnerable to cyber attack, it can really be hit. Though we have no foolproof way of preventing an attack, the incident has taught us several lessons. At least two things are clear. First, you can't do a lot as a single country. After all, the internet is global. And second, public and private parties need each other. Each has its own role, its own responsibility, and its own expertise and knowledge. Conferences like today's are a big help in embedding the kind of cooperation further, whether internationally or between the public and private sectors. I hope that your discussions this afternoon will be fruitful. Thank you for your attention.